welcome to another edition of our Breaking Down Barrier series, where we're looking at the different stigmas that are impacting the Huntington's disease community. I'm Jenna Heilman, Executive Director, and I am thrilled to be able to have an amazing group with me today to talk about drug delivery methods and specifically lumbar punctures and how some of those stigmas and fears play into the community's reaction and maybe the willingness to participate in different research and trials. And so today we have a group of people here who have a lot of experience, some experience, and are newer to the community who wanna learn more about lumbar punctures and the reasonings behind it and how they can get involved to have a very casual conversation around that. So with that, I'm going to ask um, our first expert, Dr. Jane Paulson, to introduce herself and share a little bit about who she is and, and how she supports the Huntington's disease community. Dr. Paulson? Yes, thank you. And thank you for having me here today. Um, my name is Jane Paulson. I am a neuropsychologist, so I'm not a physician. I am a psychologist. And then you uh, do advanced training to learn about the brain so that I know about uh, the brain and how it impacts our behavior and our feelings and our actions. Um, I was on a postdoc fellowship when I was assigned to the Huntington's disease patients at University of California, San Diego. And so that was my job. So I built an HD group there that has been amazing. And I met so many wonderful people. And immediately struck me that this is a group of people that are that are brave and pioneering and above and beyond what other people in the healthcare system have to face and I was continuously amazed and what I discovered is I got back more than I was able to give and uh, I think that's why I've never left uh, the field. I've been continuously funded since 1991 from the National Institute of Health to help advance what we know about Huntington's disease. I was very fortunate. I was in Venezuela with the uh, excellent research team headed by Nancy Wexler in 1993 when the gene uh, location was found and announced while we were there in Venezuela. So I've just been very fortunate to work with the best of the best. Um, I also was uh, there, when we developed the Huntington Study Group, I was on the first executive committee. I helped develop the Unified Huntington's Disease Rating Scale. Um, I've been the site PI on uh, half a dozen to a dozen clinical trials myself. And as soon as I was able, uh, I set up a study to move the envelope back. And it was the first of its kind to, to try to better understand what's called the prodrome or the beginning of Huntington's disease in people that are adults, but have the gene so they will manifest it at some time in their life. And that's, you know, I can't say enough that this is a partnership. Some of the best measures we came up with, some of the best designs we came up with for how to run clinical trials, came from you, the participants in that study, the families in that study. You are experts, and I just need to continuously thank you for participating in research. And I hope we can uh, talk today about any barriers or any concerns to continue that, because the advances that have occurred in the decades that I've been involved in this uh, research have been amazing. And I think we're really on the precipice of, of finding something that can make a difference in people's lives, which really to me is why we're here. Amazing. So just in case you didn't hear that, Dr. Paulson's kind of a legend, kind of a big deal. So uh, we're very honored to have her be here today with us. Although she's shaking her head saying like, oh my gosh, just stop, Jenna. But it's true. I'm on the wrong <laughs> Zoom call. I think I need to be in the next Zoom meeting. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. <laughs> Don't click off Chris because you're next. Chris <laughs> Brown, who's joining us from, um, from, from the U.S., I'd love for you to take a moment and introduce yourself. Hello, hello. My name is um, Chris Brown. I live in this um, beautiful city of Memphis, Tennessee. I just turned the big three nine a couple weeks ago. 
L39. Um, and I uh, tested um, gene positive for HD in 2016, August 2000. And oh my God, August 26th or 16th? What's today? Oh my God. It's the 26th. It's the 25th. So tomorrow that we are filming this. Amazing. Oh, I got, all right. Anyways, okay. Yeah, so I tested positive for um, at um, Georgetown um, under Dr. Anderson and uh, my um, my um, social worker, Chandler Slope. And I um, has just like, students I guess got tested I just jumped in um full speed ahead just like this young lady who tested negative negative and still just jumping in because he like you know we yeah just yeah and so I have I've been involved with um um Genentech um advisory board Genentech and Teva and Picnic Health and uh uh, the list goes on and on, and I um I just wanted to like be involved and do what I could to, um help the community, help my family. I have a sister at risk. I have a nephew at risk. Um, and I recently found that I have some other nieces and nephews who are already symptomatic, and um that's a entirely other story. But I have been um, just super involved with the HD community, um, and I just enjoy meeting people and um, um, spreading awareness and being involved with uh, clinical trials. And I did a clinical trial with um, Bassinex, and then I um, um, did the PREVENT study with... Um, in Wisconsin with um, Dr. Jay Paulson. And I will say that I'm not paid. I am a walking spokesperson for <laughs> um, for your study. And I have, Dr. Paulson has not paid me for the following ad. <laughs> <I'm not laughs> <my> experience <laughs> doing the uh, wave, I'm uh, not wave, the, um, the study there in Wisconsin. But yes, I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much. Thanks, Chris. And Esme, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for asking me to be here. Um, it's a privilege. Um, I am 31 and I live in the UK with my fiance and my 10-year-old son. Um, my mum got diagnosed with Huntington's disease last November in 2022. Um, it was a big shock because um, the only other family member we have that is, is positive for Huntington's disease is my uncle, which is her oldest brother. Um, now, she's one of five children uh, and no one else has tested for the disease and neither of my grandparents were known to have it, although my granddad was diagnosed with dementia um, I, I believe looking back on his symptoms that he he actually had had HD and not dementia. Um, so, yeah, I decided to get tested as soon as I found out my mum had it. I was like, I need to know for my son's sake, um, in case I want any future children, I need to know. Uh, for me, it was really an important decision to make. And also... I suppose my decision also I kind of didn't want my mum to feel alone in in getting tested and in her situation I wanted to try and support her and show her that it's okay to be scared but we can go through this together and no matter what my results or your results will will be there for each other we've got a good support network um, and I received my results earlier this year in April and I tested gene negative, which I was really grateful, really grateful and really pleased about, but it, it's brought on a lot of other um, kind of emotions and thoughts. My, pro my thought process on life is completely different. Um, 
even though I don't have the gene, I'm I'm really glad I found out. Um, it, it was a difficult decision. I didn't want to know, but I knew that by knowing that whether I had it or I didn't have it, like knowledge is power, and by educating myself as to whether I have got this gene or I haven't can help me um, in the future in decision making. Thank you all so much for sharing. We're excited to have this amazing panel together and to have this discussion. And I wanted to start off with just kind of understanding a little bit of the science and some of the basics of drug delivery methods and what types are out there when you look at the different clinical trials. And so Dr. Paulson, would you mind walking through some of those aspects in order to, to help our community better understand as we start to have a deeper conversation? Um, I was thinking through, you said, what are drug delivery methods? And the ones we're all familiar with are to, to take most commonly is to take a pill, you know, whether we have a cold or even if it's something that's treatable with a virus or bacteria, we take an antibiotic. So it's mostly oral where we take medicine uh, orally in our mouths. But the a very common method is an injection. And it is what we're talking about today is an injection or infusion, whatever you want to call it, but uh, these are much more common than we think about. And there's a range. They can, you know, you can have injections in the skin, in the vein. Intravenous is very common. You're often set up with an IV intravenous. Uh, it can be in your muscle, I am. It can be in directly into an organ, like into your abdomen, into your heart. It can be into your bone marrow or into a joint. So the injection places that they use are widely varied. Uh, the one that place that's really important for all of the brain diseases is an injection into the space around, around the spinal column or just that spinal space. And those can be called intrathecal injections it's almost very common to what is, is what people are much more familiar with is what's called an epidural, which is what many women receive for pain management in, during childbirth. And so think about that space. They literally are right next to each other, the intrathecal injection and the epidural injection. And don't, the main difference is that an epidural you leave in so you can continuously provide medicine during that episode, depending on what pain management is required. To get a lumbar puncture or to get just an injection into the cerebral spinal fluid, which is what bathes the brain, it's the liquid of the brain, just like the blood is the liquid of the heart that carries oxygen around the body. The cerebral spinal fluid is the liquid of the brain. So, oh, uh, yeah, doctor, I tend to interrupt you, but your nurses, as I took a picture with them, they said, this is the um, nectar of the gods. Oh, <laughs> thank you. It <laughs> so is. I love that, Chris. Nectar of the gods. And it is. And it is for all of the brains. So all of the brain diseases. And it's become super hot because we need to find ways to better measure and treat brain disease. And this is the time, it's exploding. For the first time ever, we have disease modifying therapies for brain diseases. We have never had this before. And as a Huntington's community, we have several that are in clinical trials, which means our disease itself is trying out methods to disease, to, to modify this disease. And the reason that's important is we do have drugs approved, but they're only to control symptoms. So you can take a, an oral medication for depression, anxiety, movements, chorea, and so on. But this is the first time that we have been testing something to really modify the disease. And what that means is it could slow down the progression, delay the onset, and help you better uh, plan. As Esme was saying, those times in your life, if you know you can push it back a little bit, what could you enjoy that you couldn't before? So it's a, it's a very exciting time. Now, the third method I have to mention, though, is surgery and devices. I was on an FDA committee for device regulation. So every device we use in our body, we have to make sure that it's safe. And for the Unicure study right now, we do brain surgery. 
and they then use a catheter and they place three, they go down three times into the specific area of the brain that degenerates in Huntington's disease. So it goes directly into the caudate, it goes in three places, and, and that requires brain surgery. So those are the three styles of drug delivery, oral, intrathecal, and surgical, or directly into the brain. Now, just to kind of take even a step back further, just as a reminder that the Huntington gene and where the Huntington mutant protein is, is produced is inside the brain. So talking about the mechanics of your body, your brain is really designed to protect itself. And so it's really difficult to get treatments directly to the brain at that source because of things like the blood brain barrier. And so it really acts as this protectant to take everything that's foreign and shoot it out of it and not even let it through. So to have the ability to go directly to the source, to have treatments in the spinal fluid are all good steps in order to provide that treatment directly to the source, which is what would be the, the disease modification. And um, I think that's important to kind of to restate a little bit why um, why it does get really challenging. Yeah, and why it's so essential. Mm -hmm. uh, they are working on, and of course, treatments for many diseases, we start with more invasive treatments just because at first we just want to figure out if we can slow this down or treat it somehow. But over time, people develop measures that might be more uh, easy on you, more safe, more feasible. But at the beginning, it, 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 it would be foolish to just start with blood treatments that can't get into the brain. And we do know, although mutant Huntington can be expressed anywhere, it really focuses on this deep brain structure called the basal ganglia. And we can see uh, in many ways, both in animal studies and brain scan studies and human studies, the progression of this disease from the back of the caudate to the front of the caudate. So it's it's really important that we get it directly where it needs to go. So thank you for reminding us about that, Jenna. I think it's really important for people to understand uh, the importance of figuring this out together. Absolutely. No, thank you for that, Dr. Paulson. Esme, as someone in the community who hasn't yet participated in research and specifically lumbar punctures, I'm curious, what do you think about that delivery method and what are some of the concerns that, that you've had um, in, in deciding maybe to or not to participate in that in the future? So I want to partake in, in research and studies and I would I would love to participate in it. I think there's just a bit of a mental block on the fact that I'm a bit concerned as to what 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 the what to expect. Um, I think with the kind of lumbar puncture um, route, I'm probably most worried about is is the side effects to it. Um, is it painful? Um, is there any risks any severe risks to it um any long-standing risks to it um i think the big one for me is you hear you know the very uncommon side effect of uh like you say sort of epidurals for for women in labor is the the kind of risk of paralysis and i think that's probably my biggest fear of it um i would like to partake in in research but yeah i think that's probably my biggest fear is not I don't know enough about it. I'm not educated enough, which is why I said yes to participating in this, this meeting. I want to gain more knowledge and educate myself more on the risks, on what it consists of, what I would need to do. Um, so yeah, that's why that's why I'm here. I think that's that's probably my most my biggest concern is the risks and the side effects to it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that those are ones that many people in the community have um, in and outside of the HD community. Chris, as we mentioned, and, and you mentioned, you've participated in a clinical trial um, and, and also the Prevent HD study. Can you share a little bit about your experiences and what some of your fears were and, and how you ended up eventually deciding to, to go through with this type of, um, of treatment and delivery method? All right. I um, I... Remember when I 
for deciding if I wanted to do a clinical trial. And I remember getting a call and um, from Georgetown and they were like, we think you'd be a great uh, candidate for um, Bassinex. Mm -hmm. And I was, um, and I was like, okay, well, yes, I think it's the time. I think I'm ready. You know, I was like, I think I'm ready. So I went in and I did an 18 month trial <laughs> with uh, Vasinex. Uh, and it was, um, and on top, to begin with though, like I just to make a public announcement, like I am, uh, let's just settle with the word pansy. I hate needles. So the fact that I was already going to do a clinical trial which involved needles, which my <laughs> coordinator, Robin, was like, you did know that we were going to be using needles, right? <laughs> I was like, I know, but I just, I, she was like, and so like, I had to honestly get over my extreme fear of needles. And I'm talking about like, I could just like hate it, that feel of something being inside my arm. And <laughs> I mean, I just hated it all my life. I hated needles. And so it took me a good, I would say, I went in for 18, um, 17 infusions. And I would say I didn't start getting comfortable with needles until like my sixth or seventh month. Like it was a thing. Like Robin was like, Chris, you do know you can quit at any time. I was like, I can't quit. I have to keep going. I have to. And she was like, Chris, you do not have to. And I was like, you just don't understand. I have to do this. And I eventually I got over it. And then the next thing I know, I'm blogging and I'm laying there and I have two meals in <laughs> some time and I'm blogging. <laughs> hey guys, or I'm like taking a picture of the infusion and just praying over it and um and was just and just doing great. And so midway through, they were like, hey, Chris, would you like to do a, um, like, this isn't mandatory, but would you do a, be interested in doing a lumbar puncture? I said, what? Mm -hmm. Lumbar who? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, lumbar. <laughs> Like, lum, no. Like, <laughs> like, no. And, and so I was, like, extremely, like, I will not participate in a lumbar puncture, period. Can we keep going? Like, I don't even want to hear about this. And, um, and I didn't feel bad about it, you know? And so, but then, like, you know, in the community, just, like, as time went on and time went on, this whole thing about, um, lumbar punctures just kind of you know kept growing around you know the community because things will have changed and advanced and we're trying to find better ways to, you know get past that blood brain barrier so I um I um I got it so I went on finished my um trial and um fast forward a couple months um maybe a couple years not months years um my best friend in the entire world his name is Seth Rockford and I, he's um, a, he's the Superman of Huntington. And I love him dearly. I respect him. I look up to him. I, um, I just think he's the best thing on the, he's like the, he's just amazing human being. Okay, I'm sorry. And so when, um, he said, hey, Chris, I'm going to, so one day on our talk, um, he was like, hey, Chris, I'm going to do the um, um, prevent study in Wisconsin. And I was like, yeah. I was like, what's that about? And so he started telling me about it. And I was like, oh, cool. Okay, well, okay, okay. And so my initial, when I think of a lumbar puncture, I think of like, am I going to like draw up and tense up and like when they stick it in there, will my Will I like do something to break the needle off and it stays in my back and I don't know, or is it gonna, when I hold my legs, am I gonna jerk or, 
is it gonna like help something else and everything goes to you know like just all these things will run through your mind and it's like I was also thinking as well, Chris, to add to that, how big is the needle? That for me is another is another worry of like you were saying about where is it going? Like how long and big is this needle? Exactly. I'm thinking they're gonna come out with a with a prodding, like <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm just like like no, like I was just I was just had all these fears of like. What if I jerk? What if I move? What if I'm too tense? What if I turn? What if they prick or what if just what if, what if, what if? Like, you know, and it's just like so like scary. I'm just like, oh my God, it's gotta be so painful because like it's like the only thing they use it for is for ladies who are like giving birth. <laughs> and like, so it's like a, you know one time your entire life you're going to need it is for when you're giving birth and I was like well I'm not giving birth so I don't need it I don't want that <laughs> you know I want no part of it girl Seth got on that plane flew to Wisconsin slept that night woke up the next morning did his lumbar puncture was on the plane back home that night and was sleeping in his bed that night and I was like, what? He was like, yeah. And then I called him the next morning. I'm like, Seth, are you okay? You doing all right? Are you fine? He's like, yeah. That's just, just sitting here working this morning. I was like, but you had a lumbar puncture yesterday. He's like, yeah, I know. I said, are you okay? He's like, I mean, I'm a little sore. And he was like, I, he's like, I had a, a my, I could have a headache or something. And I was like, but you're fine? And he said, yeah, pretty. I was like, well, I guess maybe I, I mean, okay. And then that little, <laughs> you know, well, I mean, if Seth did it, then I can do it, you know? I'm not a big pansy. I can do it too. Fast forward, I don't know how many months, I find myself flying to Wisconsin. <laughs> And going in that morning, but it wasn't just the, it wasn't just the process of the needle. It was, the room was like, it was like, a, I remember the sun shining so bright through the room, which sounded like really makes me feel good. Mm -hmm. um, the nurses were, it was like, and it wasn't anywhere ever close to being like in a emergency room setting or in like a, it was like, but first, I have to start off by saying the nurses. It was a it was a multiple thing of people that were super welcoming, super nice. The nurses themselves were just, I mean, it was a godsend that I had the nurses that I had, and that's what scares me is because I don't want to come on here and tell my story, and then somebody gets has a bad experience, and now from from listening to me and. So this is my experience. I'm making sure I say that. This is my experience that, and other people's experience too because I went on the heels of someone else. And um, my experience was the nurses were unbelievably nice to me. They laughed and talked with me. They walked me through everything. We like even kind of did like a whole practice run of how I would lay and how I would pull my knees to my chest and how I would be relaxed. Cause I was like, doing that would be so uncomfortable. But when I did it, it wasn't because they had their way of making it to where I was just like comfortably laying there on my side with my knees pulled up and they were talking me through it. And I mean, I was so comfortable and I was like, hey, you guys, can I videotape this and put this on? Facebook, because, like, I really need for people to see. Like, I just don't think you'll, you'll grasp it with just words. And they were like, sure. Videotaped it. The nurses were just so nice. And, I mean, they went, I got in position. They went in. And I can feel it. I'm not going to lie. It was uncomfortable. It was pressure. It was, but she was like, she was like, just stay just like you are. I know you feel the pressure. You're about to feel this. You're about to feel that. 
just do this. And it wasn't hard for me to stay still. And it was just like, it actually was not, it was, it was the pressure. That was pressure. You could tell something was in your back, 100%. Was it painful? No, no it was, pre it was uncomfortable pressure. Okay. You know? Yeah. Uncomfortable pressure, but not painful. Okay. You and know? if you're needles anyway I'm sure that sort of thing usually would be quite in your head you would think it would be painful right so if someone like you can come away and say oh it it, it just felt more like a pressure it was uncomfortable and not like it was agony then right. it right. really can't be that bad right experiences with needles tell the truth mm -hmm. you know they get a bad stick and you're like oh my god it hurts so bad I've had bad sticks with paint with needles that hurt worse than this did. Yeah, I was, I'm not lying. I'm really not lying. Mm -hmm. And so I, it was just an uncomfortable pressure. And once, like, I just breathed through it and just stayed relaxed. And I was like, okay, 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 okay. I can lay like this for a couple of minutes because it all lasts for about I don't I don't think it's more than ten minutes. Okay. And, um, and they pull it out. And I was like, okay, you can roll over now. And I rolled over and I was just like, oh my God, I did a spinal tap. I did a spinal tap. And then she was like, so hey, here they are, the two vials. And she was holding the two vials. I was like, oh my God, can we take a picture? And like, they all got in and we took a selfie and with their hanging. And I was like, I just cannot believe I did a spinal tap. I can't. And you have to stay in there and lay, around, lay there for another hour or so to make sure you're fine. And I went home, flew back home, to sleep in my bed the next night. And I was just blown away. I was literally blown away. And um, Jimmy Pollard is one guy who I think if anybody got was affected by me blogging and posting it on Facebook about that was Jimmy Pollard, the most random person I know. But he is like the grandfather of HD in the U.S. And so... Um, but yes, that was my experience with doing a spinal tap. And I would do it again. I'm supposed to be scheduling in my next appointment. Um, Y'all reached out a couple of times, Dr. Paulson, but I'm so busy. But um, <laughs> so if you see my name on people who have... <laughs> we'll got see you when you can do it. You're the boss. You, you I mean, honestly... It's all around your schedule. No one's gonna. I no I was gonna, gonna say you're on record now, so we'll all have you for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dr. Paulson, it seems like we have a few recurring themes here um, about some of the fears, whether it's the effects post um, procedure, pain, needle size, all of these different things, and I think that some of that comes from some of the um, more last minute needs to be able to do this kind of procedure in an emergency setting. So Chris kind of hit it hit on some of those points, but what are some of the differences between what someone might experience if they had to get tested for meningitis or something um, really quickly in the ER to what you all do in um, a more comfortable space for this kind of procedure? Yeah, we really believe in making the research experience as comfortable as possible. And it's so important to have good people. And when I said you're the boss, I we believe that first and foremost. This is a partnership and that doesn't mean, you know, anybody's more important than the other one. If we don't have the persons who are willing to volunteer, then we don't have any research and we can't advance what we know about Huntington's disease. So we have to work together and we will listen to any feedback. And if some of the feedback is, well, I don't want it to be like an emergency room. Well, that's pretty easy because it's not. It's all planned ahead of time. Uh, I make efforts to have someone that's very experienced uh, with doing these procedures. I recently switched. I don't know if Chris had one of the new investigators that I've recruited, but I did recruit anesthesiologists who do this for a living all day long, every day. day. And um, I will say Chris's experience isn't the same as everyone's experience, 
The worst thing that happens though is a, is a headache. And we have had those. And I had them at a higher rate when I moved from Iowa to Wisconsin because we were still figuring out how to make it a red carpet Disneyland experience because that's the goal, right? The goal is it's our job to make it the most comfortable. It's your job to bring yourself and it takes, oh my goodness, it takes, you know, that bravery that Chris talked about. It takes taking the time off, uh, you know, from your daily life, which as we all know, time is precious, so precious. So there's there's got to be give and take on both sides. So um, those of you who have had headaches, it doesn't happen every time. It means nothing about your episode. Uh, it can typically, we did over 300 lumbar punctures in Iowa, and now we've done 100 in Wisconsin. In the early uh, phases, we didn't have it worked out and we had more headaches. We haven't had any now for a very long time. We're getting it down. Um, and if you do have a headache, there's a treatment for it. So uh, it, it isn't any you know thing where, oh no, how long they can have this. Uh, and to answer your questions, yeah, the needle is not like a needle you stick in your arm. It has, it's flexible. It's more like a piece of hair. If you have thick hair, it's, it's literally like a piece of hair. It's very flexible. It's very mm -hmm. thin so that it can go in. It's, it's even amazing. If you look at it with your eyes, you go, how can that have fluid in the middle? It doesn't seem like something that would even have a tube, right? That you would pull the, the fluid out with, but it's that thin. And then if it, it, I think the longest it would be, I don't know, you know, nine, nine centimeters, I think, but that's centimeters. That was too big even. It's not that big. <laughs> so, so, you know, everything is planned to have it be the most uh, possible, the, the best possible experience. I want to get back to Esme's concern that, you know, you could end up paralyzed. I have never heard of that experience, but you're going to list everything uh, mm -hmm. on, on any procedure because you want people to realize, you know, I don't know how that would occur, how this uh, really tiny flexible needle would occur. I'm sure it's less than a, a thousandth of 1%. I'm sure it's so little we can't even mathematically give you a number. I, I've, I've never heard of it, but um, I think you always have to know in your head what what you're doing and i think um, i don't want to jump ahead but the stuff that your guys are going through of course you should go through we shouldn't ever jump into something without knowing right what am yeah. i getting into what are the pros what are the cons what might happen how likely is it to happen uh, is it going to be a permanent condition is it you know those are the things that it's our responsibility to figure out together and to share with one another. Um, I am a big advocate in making sure all the information is out there. Uh, Can I ask, yeah. um, with, with regards to the side effect of a headache, um, how is that caused by the lumbar puncture and how long does it last? Is it resolved just by, uh, you know, basic analgesia? Uh, it, it's a great question. You know, the, the CSF, like the blood, the CSF regenerates in itself literally before you're probably up off the bed. It's so fast. Our bodies are so amazing, aren't they? You know, how they can heal and yeah. how they can regenerate. I mean, we're not lizards going to grow a new tail, but come on. It's amazing <laughs> what our bodies can do. So theoretically, the idea is you've taken some fluid from the brain. Uh, you know, you might have mild head pain. I think mild head pain is something, and just head pain is something that's very common. I don't think there's a person in the world that would say I've never had a headache because we get headaches from sun, tension, not drinking enough, not eating enough, not sleeping enough. It's very common. And then you, you give people the idea that this is the side effect. I would say a lot of people do say, yes, I had a mild headache. The more the type of headache that continues and you can't continue your daily work, then we give what's called a, a blood patch. And what that does is just in case that little area doesn't seal up in, and it's not in the spinal cord, just so you know, it, it, it's in the, the spinal 
space, you know, is, is there's a bunch of stuff going on in that area. So they put it on just to accelerate healing if there is a little piece that hasn't healed yet. And typically, and that takes care of it. I've never had anyone get a blood patch that ha that hasn't taken care of it. So there's a treatment, it goes away, nothing's permanent. Um, your questions are spot on. And the theoretical reason is because of the loss of fluid, just like when you give blood, they say, oh no, you got to drink, you got to eat, you know, don't do any strenuous activity. It's a similar concept that you want to keep your body in homo homostasis. You want to keep it balanced. So I think it's that same, that same principle. Okay. So, thank you. And just from the, the patient perspective, participant perspective, um, what would you say would be good for them to ask ahead of time to the, the medical professionals who would be performing this in order for them to feel a little bit more comfortable leaning into it? Well, I, I don't want my colleagues to be upset with me, but it is, I have seen a difference in comfort level with people who are doing their first one, of course, you know, or even your, if you really only do them once a year, you know, versus someone who does them all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, it's so amazing when you watch them. I've, I've, I've been in there for several of them. Sometimes I take the samples and put them, you know, prop, put them in the freezer so we can ship them. You know, I've been in there for many of them and it becomes much more fluid like anything, right? If you do it enough, it becomes a habit. You know, there's all those books about atomic habits where I'm, I'm totally into trying to get the person who it's become a habit for because they know right away, okay, I'm going to move it this way and this way and I've got it. You know, I, I, I rarely see uh, kind of that and get over that anxiety that you feel for good reason and the physician feels for good reason too. So uh, I, I think it does make a difference. Mm -hmm. Um and you can ask all those questions. Mm -hmm. What type of needle are you using? How long is it? All of those, anything you need, there's nothing off the table. You ask whatever you want to ask. They can give them sitting up where you just lean over. They can give them, we typically do them laying down where you kind of go in a fetal position, you know, curl up, but you can do them many, many different ways. And you are the boss, mm -hmm. honestly. We're in a partnership. This isn't a hierarchy. We work together to make it work the best. So um, it sounds like at first you were kind of alluding to maybe asking, would the person who is actually doing the procedure, what's their comfortability level? How many do they do? How many do you do on average in this clinic each week or month or whatever it is? Because then those are some of the questions that you could kind of gauge comfortability, which would then let you feel comfortable that it is something that they see very frequent in order to um, have that experience that they may want. Yeah. And, you know, there are people that are just good at it. Yeah. People that are just simply good at it. They have the right technique. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are the, I've had a lot of uh, physicians tell me, oh, no, I don't want to do those for you because, you know, I do, I find the best partner mm -hmm. to be the best partner for all of us in this research study. And I've been really fortunate to get good people who are going to be uh, as empathic and concerned about you as a human, you know. I think that's really important to put the science. Yeah, that's really important for a from a patient point of view. Um, I think that's really important that the you know the clinician is on the holistic side of things, trying to make you feel comfortable, making sure you're emotionally okay. It is kind of looking out for you and looking after you. The you know if they can do the medical side of things like with their eyes shut then great but but actually making sure you're comfortable that you have you know your questions are answered um i think that's really really important and it sounds like you've got a great great team who who do that for for your patients yes yeah, chris will comment too and i agree I um i do re i remember um thinking well, okay, you know how you can go to a doc, go see your doctor for something. You're at the hospital, then they like send you off to go take a have a CAT scan or an MRI or something, and so you have to like leave that part of the hospital that like you're used to or that you're you know or you know the you know nurses the west where you would normally go. 
-hmm. and you have to leave that area and you go over to take a CAT scan or MRI or something. And then when you get there, this person, you just sits there and they say, oh, you know, call your number. Then you go in there and the person just like, you know, there's a person there just doing the procedure and then like you're done. And then they send you back over to your doctor mm -hmm. and your nurses or whatever. And that, and that's how I was, I was scared. Like, I was like, oh my God, are they just going to like send me over to, you know, wherever and like, just like throw me to these people that don't know anything about scientists, don't know anything about, you know, what I'm going through or anything and just like do what they had to give me this final thing. And then I have to go back over to, you know, where the people, the prevent people were. And so I was kind of like worried, like, will they treat me, you know, are they just going to treat me like, you know, like pick up a pack and say, Chris Brown, mm -hmm. and then I come in there and then I do it. Like and a just, number, not as a person. Uh, like a, treating you like a number, not as a person is what you were exactly, worried about. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so that's what the, that was in my mind too, when I was going, when I was flying there, I was like, now the area so far, all of my interactions have been really um, pretty good with um, um, with them. I was like, but I said, oh my God, what if they just send me over somewhere to take a, you know, to get this done. And I'm just like in no man's land and these, like it really, and then it really hurts, you know? And I remember, and then like, I just couldn't get over how nice and how, just those nurses and whoever they were, we just had a black. <laughs> and they were just so, so I just, I I didn't feel like, it. and on top of that, the, the prevent people came with me and like waited outside the door and like, it was like, we'll be here when you, you come out and like walk me back to where we were supposed to go. And, um, um, but I just remember it was such a combination of the nurses and like the communication and just I they were just so they were just unbelievable. I was so like, it sounds oh like you had a good experience leading up to it. That even though you had that good experience, you still had those same nerves because that's normal. Everybody has a, right. has those nerves that build up from a procedure, but. I think that that's that's a good thing to take home. So as a as someone who's considering participating, if you're having challenges at the beginning, maybe dig a little bit more into some of those details. So your nerves are still going to be there, but you feel comfortable and and in, in entrusting people into or entrusting these people with with this procedure to take care of you. And also, I think it's important for people to note that um, you can always say no. Um, even leading up to the procedure, it's fine if you if you ultimately feel uncomfortable for you to to take a step back. It is perfectly normal to have anxiety to anything novel. And this this whole protocol is novel. Novel is just new. Anything new. That's the way we're hardwired. If we didn't have it, we wouldn't have survived. It's evolutionary, right? We are supposed to, when we have something new, we're supposed to do the old fight, flight, or freeze, right? You either, it's new, I'm scared, fight is I'm too scared, I can't do it, flight, run away, don't volunteer, or freeze, you just can't even move, you can't make a decision. That is normal. I can embrace it and say, thank you for, for giving me the, the way I can get through life. Because right. that is what cues you, ask your questions, figure out what's going to go on here. And the person needs to listen. So it's it's a good instinct. Listen to that instinct, the instinct to listen to your fears, listen to your anxiety, and, and, and then find out the answers you need. Um, frankly, it gives an opportunity for you to hear what you need and for us to figure out how can we get through that response because it's perfectly normal. For me, the best thing I can do for anyone who's anxious about participating in research is to listen, is to listen and to help them listen. Okay, what is that nervousness or fear telling you? And, and what do we need to do? Practice sessions, awesome. Uh, one thing, first share the facts, share the size of the needle, how long it takes, how long if you get a headache, how long it lasts, what other symptoms or side effects might occur. Um, show examples, either photos, cartoons, 
watch the procedure with someone else. Some people that have families come together and they want to watch one first and then they might come back and volunteer. Uh, we've had great volunteers and Seth is an awesome one. I'm glad you brought him up, Chris, because he and the other one that's been great is BJ Vow. These are both people that have just volunteered for everything. They volunteered to be videotaped. BJ's first lumbar puncture, he literally did on videotape and we have it posted. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. I, yeah. this is okay. I am totally into, and I, I would do the procedure myself. I've done it myself. I wanted them to videotape it and put it online, but they said it would be coercive. So I couldn't put it online, <laughs> um, but we can post any other family members, people that, that you want. The point is you're the boss always forever. No one can make you do this. Yes, it's going to help Huntington's disease, but you're always the boss. And as Jenna said, you can always say, okay, change my mind. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> or maybe another day. Sometimes people say, you know, I am game to do this, but I've had a lot going on this week and it's not a good time. And that's fine. Perfectly fine. So Esme, we've heard a lot of things and um, you're not an outlier with having doubts and concerns and not having participated. So one, do you feel like your questions have been answered? And two, what are, how has your opinion changed about this discussion? Yeah, definitely. Um, I feel like my, my questions have been answered really well. Um, I feel like the, the fear, when we started this and you asked like, what, what are your concerns? I was, I was thinking, right, if I was really gonna go into this, how would I feel? And, and what are the questions I feel I need to ask about the fears that I have and the concerns I have and I feel like my questions have all been answered and I feel more assured you know reassured that if I were to partake in in the study which I feel actually I feel more um inspired to actually especially hearing Chris's story I feel inspired now to actually go and partake in in the studies in the UK um, even a lumbar puncture, which before this conversation and this interview would have scared the living daylights out of me. Daylight. Having to you hear me? Every day lights out of me. <laughs> out one, yeah. I know. And I'm thinking, oh, needles in my back and it's going to be painful. Gonna, am I going to bleed? Is, it, is there going right. to be food going everywhere? Yeah. But I feel, oh. I feel like speaking to all three of you is made my mind feel a bit more at peace and I feel more re uh, reassured to to go ahead and participate in in the studies I feel like I've learned a lot as well I feel a lot more educated and I think that is a massive part to play in that and why I got tested and why I wanted to partake in this and become a HDYR ambassador is because education is power knowledge is power if you know about the dis disease if you educate yourself you participate in trials you participate in these meetings and and looking online and all of these things you can do to raise awareness for yourself and other people it can benefit yourself and the community of of people with hd and and their caregivers because the more people out there that we can reach then the better we are at finding a solution to treat HD or at least slow the process of it um, and, and get more support from people. So yeah, I feel it's been really beneficial this conversation. I feel a lot more empowered by it and ready to go and take on some studies. <laughs> and I think too, that's fantastic. And I think too, um, I, I wanna highlight a few things that you have to say, but also add in a couple of things. So one, you're right. The education can help diminish some of those real huge fears that you may have, but like we've kind of echoed that those nerves and anxiety and anticipation are still gonna be there. And I think it's important for you to kind of understand what is a true fear and what's typical for me leading up to this that I'm gonna feel no matter what. And to be able to separate that, I think is gonna be really important. And I also think it's important that there are a lot of these observational studies that you don't have to have gone through testing yet to participate in. You will, um, depending on the study, 
they will need to know if you do have um, Huntington, have the, the Huntington mutation, have the Huntington gene, but you don't have to find out and you can still participate. So that's an important question to ask as well is do you have to know what my, do I have to know what my genetic status is in order to participate or can I participate and you all know, but I don't have to know. And so those are some of those that open line of communication is so important. And so there's a lot of observational studies that are happening right now all over the world. Um, of course, there's Enroll HD, which has been out there for, for a decade now and has done tremendous work. There's HD Clarity, there's Prevent HD that Dr. Paulson is the, um, uh, the PI for, and a lot of other things that are happening on a local level. Um, so, so I really encourage you to check it out, start the communication, ask about it, just pay attention on social media as people are posting to share their experiences because it might be something where just like Chris, you have a friend who's done it or a friend of a friend or someone who you've grown to respect on social media and you see their experiences and it might calm some of those nerves. But you can also yeah. find out more at hdyo.org under the research section at the different HD trial finder sites or simply message us and we're happy to get you in contact. For rare diseases, we do have a uh... A disadvantage, we don't get the press, the popularity, the money, the resources that the prevalent diseases get. But I will tell you that historically, what we do as a rare disease has helped millions of other people. The people with the more common diseases often are helped because the rare diseases have been the brave. And I think the, the, that pioneering spirit is can impact not just this disease, but many other diseases. And that have, has happened many, many times. Why participate in research is because it takes up to 15 years for a new treatment, a billion dollars for a new treatment. And if we do observational studies first, it launches us towards that clinical trial. If we don't do it before they have the treatment ready, then they have to do all the same stuff we're doing. We have to answer those questions. When should they intervene? What kind of participant can benefit from the trial? You know, how are we gonna know if it's working? Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't have any symptoms, you're pre-symptomatic, how are we gonna know if something is working? And the answer so far is we need cerebral spinal fluid to see if it's working. So it all comes to a circle of, as soon as those scientists get a treatment, we wanna be ready. And that's what PREVENT is about. PREVENT is about developing the whole design so they can come in to us and say, what age people, at what point in their life, what should they look like on their cognitive, motor, quality of life scale? Uh, what are the best measures so we can see if it's working? It, it, and so on and so on. What does the MRI look like? At what stage can we go in so it's early enough that the MRI hasn't lost very much? These are the important questions that we're really trying to answer. And I will give Jenna contact information, spread the word. You know, we are interested in making a difference. And right now they're treating only using intrathecal injections or brain surgery, right? So it, we really need the volunteers. And you can always say no, and you're the boss. And the other thing is uh, get in touch, even if all you want to do is observe a visit. You can always just get in touch and see where your comfort level is. Listen to yourself. We respect you. Can I just ask Lawson, can I just ask you one more quick question? Um for the for the research, for the studies, what is the impact of someone like myself who's gene negative, but it obviously is part part of my family? Like it can I still impact and and, and make an impact? Oh my gosh, I'm so, oh, it's like a miracle that you asked that question. It's the most important thing right now. So we have volunteers in my study right now that are gene positive, but when they look at the question of how are we going to know if this is a, you know, what's significantly different in your number of neural filament light chain or your number on mutant Huntington, how much is in your CSF? No one knows unless we get a whole bunch of family members that do not have the mutation. Like, how do we know if Chris's performance on finger tap is, is even slow? Some people are just slower than others. I'm one of the slower than others. I never was a track star. So how do we know if it's really significantly different? And it's, it's essential for a clinical trial. We don't want to say it works if it doesn't work. We want to make it better like they're doing right now. They take the studies they've shut down 
Both of them have opened back up better. That's what they do. So we need the gene negatives. So important to figure out what do your levels look like in the CSF? What does your performance look like on these tests? What does your brain imaging look like, right? And you're the best comparison group because you have the same what's called your environment and the whole rest of your DNA is the same. So you are by far the best comparisons. If you take a, a you know, healthy volunteer off the street, they have everything different. So it just adds noise and we, we can't interpret it as easily. So thank you for asking so important. Thank you for answering. Yeah, I thought it was a really important question to answer, um, to ask you. Yeah, you for that, Esme, that's, that's fantastic. All right, what, um, what would you like to say as we wrap up this conversation? I'll go first. Um, <laughs> Oh, thank you, Jenna, so much for everything you do for us. I, um, you've just been a godsend to the HD community, and that's an understatement. It's an understatement. Um, I joke a lot, but that I mean that one hundred percent. Like you, you really have. Um, I don't even want to get started on. That's another call for <laughs> reasons why I say that. Um, <laughs> I also want to say to Esme, I, uh, I feel your energy. I feel your passion. I feel your, um, your fears. I feel your, um, your curiosity. I feel your, um, your bravery. I feel your heart and how it is just like open to wanting to help and to know and to like grow. And I, it just makes me so happy. And it just reminds me of where I was. And I just want to just be like a cautionary tale of just take things as they come. Do what you want to do. Don't do what you don't want to do. Just be, support the people that you love dearly. Be an advocate as much as you want to be. Be a sister, be a wife, be a child to your mom and just like just support them on a level that is healthy for you and um the opportunities will come and just I'm just so happy you're not gene negative and you still are involved in the AC community and just I yeah oh you're so lovely thank you you would give the best advice and like I don't know, I feel like you've kind of inspired me today with your story of how you'd been been through the, the lumbar puncture and it's it's made me feel ready. I feel ready to go and do it. I you know, the okay. fact that you don't like needles, I'm like, well, if he doesn't like needles, I mean, I pass out when I have a blood test. <laughs> As so, my, I can't if we weren't on this call, I would talk to you like I really would like to talk to you. <laughs> You can you can get my details from Jenna. It's absolutely I fine. <laughs> yeah, the last thing I wanted to say really was, um, I really appreciate being given the opportunity to be part of this conversation with all three of you. It's opened my eyes. It's educated me. It's reassured me. It's inspired me and empowered me. And I really am grateful for being able to be part of this and to all three of you for, you know, inspiring me and educating me as someone that had no clue whatsoever about, you know, this this participation of, of studies and research. Um, and also obviously to Jenna, I've only ever met you obviously once at Congress, but reiterating like what Chris said, you're just, just an angel to the HD community, you really are like, because you're so supportive. And going into this, I honestly thought, Whoever, who I'd never met you before, I thought whoever this Jenna is, she's going to be some high fly woman in a, you know, who who's going to be getting mega mega bucks for sitting behind a computer and organising all these things, but she won't be at any of them. You see it in the movies, don't you? All these high flying people at the top of the rank in these kind of charities. Keep going, keep going. You you honestly are just the most genuinely kind and caring and compassionate and amazing person I think I've ever met and 
I just I just love you so much for just being that person for supporting you there's so many of us there's so many of us in the HD community and yet I feel like you really care about me as an individual and Chris probably feels that way and all the other ambassadors feel that way you as one person make us feel empowered and make us feel unique and like we matter and I just I just want to thank you for for being you well that's yes. so sweet Girl. this is so unexpected that wasn't what I was or even thought of for closing thoughts <laughs> also, one last thing is to people that are going to be watching this um or hearing about this this conversation like Chris said to me earlier it's it's important to do what's right for you 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 do something then do it you don't want to do it don't do it do what's right for you your gut is always right and will will you'll know what to do but for me was the best decision I ever made, not just because I'm gene negative, but the unknown was more scary for me than being gene positive. Being gene positive, I can know about it, I can educate myself, I can plan, I can really enjoy my time and be in the present and enjoy life. But the unknown, I, I couldn't handle. So it, for me, it was the best decision I made. And yes, it's scary. And yes, there was a lot of anxiety. Um, but I'm really glad I did it. And raise as much awareness as you can. Um, and yeah, hopefully we can, we can get somewhere with studies and research and raising awareness. That you happens. guys are amazing. Oh, amazing. Oh, I want to meet and see both of you again and again. And I hope I will. Oh, thank you all so much. Oh, my heart is full and I'm going to keep, I'm going to keep this for my personal bad days so I can just play this. <laughs> and it's yeah. such a pleasure to be able to work with you too and the whole community because I think we all just draw such inspiration from each other. And um, I'm so grateful for you all to take the step to do this interview because it's not easy. It's not easy to share your story. It's not easy to get involved in a way where others are looking to you as, as leaders of the community, but you both do it with such grace and and ease. So thank you both. And for those who are watching, as Esme said, and it's reiterated, you are the controllers of your journey. You have every right to choose your path. Um, and there are many ways to get involved. And even by watching this video, you are making that step forward to um, empowering yourself and being your own advocate. And we as a collective community, HDYO, associations across the globe are all here to support you in any way that we can with questions, with um, connections, with local resources. So never hesitate to reach out um, and, uh, and you have a family around you. But thank you all so much for today. This has been amazing. I hope you've learned some things and, um, and this concludes our, our series of breaking down barriers talking about drug delivery methods, specifically lumbar punctures. So thank you all very much.